Good evening, good evening, and welcome along to the Big Show Christmas Special here on NVTV. I've had a great lineup of guests we have for you this evening, including Belfast's grandfather of punk, Terry Hooley, is going to be here, because, of course, it wouldn't be Christmas without him. We'll be chatting to actress Pam St. Clement. Of course, she played Pat Butcher in EastEnders for many years, and 80s music legend Lamal will also be with us. Loads more coming up as well, including our first guest, who's back out on the road with a show called Rock and Roll years and dance hall days. It's the one and only George Jones. How are yes. you, sir? Uh, balding Pete, slightly. <laughs> <laughs> Lost her since the last time we spoke. <laughs> but uh, here we are again, Robin. Uh, I mean, it's incredible to think it's a two-year vacuum uh, since we actually performed the show. So for people who haven't seen this before, what can they expect then? <laughs> I, it all started really with a concert idea about uh, maybe about seven or eight years ago. I said, you know, what is missing is a little look back to some of the great years of music, uh, the 50s and mm -hmm. 60s, which a lot of people go, what? Poo -poo? Oh, no. But there's a lot of people who also say, oh, yes, please. You know, eight years ago, we started a concert just as a, depicting great stars of those particular years. And what we did was in the band club sound was the basis of it with four singers. So primarily, the stage is set with a coffee bar on one side, and an agent's office on the other. I play Harmy the agent, good boy, good Jewish lad, and uh, who spots all these stars. And I play in an English one and an American one. Sometimes I get mixed up. <laughs> Discovering the stars in Britain and the, the stars in America. Telling the original names, how they come into an office looking for work. I build them up and make them stars. There's about 40 songs in the show, and we encapsulate everything from way back to uh, Neil Sedaka, you right. know, even even further back, Guy Mitchell, Wanda Jackson, and early Elvis is depicted at the start because he becomes the other Elvis at the end. Yes, yeah. Uh, so we're trying to make it like a journey, you know, through those wonderful years. The, uh, Cliff Richard, the Beatles, uh, uh, we do the Four Seasons. The shadows bring the house down. You see, w what I've always said in the years that I was on radio for, for 30 odd years, I used to say that songs are like calendars. The minute you play a song, nine times out of 10, people, they associate it with where they were, yeah. what they were doing, and it immediately picks a picture, yes. a paints a picture. Yes, yeah. Do the, does the music of that do it nowadays? It doesn't, it really doesn't. You know. Do you miss the days on the radio? I do. Yeah. I, I miss them because I had a wonderful audience and, and I felt I was a, a friend of the thousands, which give you a wonderful feeling. I mean, you used to come off at five o'clock at night you felt very satisfied that you'd help some people. Yes. Yeah. And I did, I helped a lot of people along the way. And I remember getting a, a wonderful lesson from a great broadcaster. And he turned around to me and I said, what should I do? It was the beginning of my career because I was entertaining sort of thousands of people on the stage, but to transfer that into one microphone yeah. and not saying anybody, I says, how do you cope with that? And he says, you just be yourself and just imagine that you're talking to one person. Yeah and that person will become the thousands out there because everybody feels that you're talking to them yeah. anyway. That's and true. the more singularly you can make it, the better. That's true. And you, you don't really know how well, you, you'll know this from your experience on Radio Rob. You have Rajar figures and all this and everything it's else. It's nonsense. Nobody knows how well you're doing yeah. on radio, but there are things that you do, and I started inventing these things like the surprise calls yes. and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, you couldn't even do that in radio now. And when people talk about you on the radio, the other thing they always say, they always mention Sadie as well. Yeah, Sadie, Sadie was a character that I, it's, it's part of stage. You know, it's part of what we were doing in Club Sound. I decided this day, this week cleaner would walk in and she started giving me a hustles because she had to get her work done. That's where it started. Wow. And it, I became like a ventriloquist, because yeah. I think everybody knows now it was me that was doing it. But in those early years, yeah. I had people coming up to me and saying, now who is Sadie? It's you, isn't it? <laughs> I says, how could it be me? Because I pre-recorded the weather and talked into it, so I had two ways. Yes, I did yeah. Sadie's Cultural Corner, where I talked to her as yeah. well while she was reading the poem. Yes, the yeah. art of you know technology, what yeah. you could do, I used it. But then you would get guys, especially at functions, you've been to them, where maybe you're the speaker or the MC of the night. People come, what about Sadie? Then it is you, it is you. Like, no, no, you might be a bishop or, yeah. or an, an MLA or an MP, <laughs> what it was called at the time, come on, said, but George, come on over here. 
you can tell me. Yes, you know, yes, I yes. says, I'm not telling you. I didn't tell them. Why should I tell you? But it was just a beloved period. Yeah. And then I brought in Sidney, the street singer, who was, a, was doing the double and the brew, yeah. but he was singing busking as well. And he kept watching out for the cops. And he used to go, mm, I've got that great wee number. And Mike Cato, who was a great film critique, he was on with me every Friday. He helped me write a lot of the little openings oh, and brilliant. clips. And my, would take a, a, a very well-known song, but put the topic of mm -hmm. the week into the song. Yes. And yeah. Sydney would do this and you oh, heard the money get into the hat. There's me throwing coins in the sound <laughs> according to and then he would spot I've gotta go, Mr. Jones, gotta get off here, got cops are oh, See him yeah, doing yeah. characters like that, but there were Northern Ireland characters from Northern Ireland humour. That's basically where it came all out of. Club Sound became like a phenomena because we did a show. We yeah. didn't play for dancing, we did two hours of a sit down watch show and brought the people the humour that they'd lost. The yeah. longer we can do it, we hope that people just keep enjoying it, you know? And I find a lot of people buying tickets for their parents and for their grandparents as a gift to go back. Exactly, just to listen yes, to the music. Yes, yeah. And that's very, very heartwarming, yeah. you know, to, to have that. You well, know. George, we're looking forward to it. Rock and roll years, dance all days, back yep. out on the road, early 2022. We could do this all day, all sit day. and talk like this. All but day. do you know what we'll do? We'll do a Club Sound special yeah. on VTV next yeah. year. Yeah? Before we hit the Zimmer frames. Before we hit the Zimmer frames, <laughs> we will do that, I promise. What's Christmas going to store for you? Uh, at home, uh, yes. sadly, because of COVID, I can't get my son and his wife home from Austria. They come home every year for Christmas. But we will have, uh, our daughter lives next door. We've got the, our two beautiful grand daughters yeah. and a few other people and we'll have a nice family Christmas. Brilliant. I'm loving all the paintings by the way as well. Yeah it's been a new vocation for me. It's, it, it has saved my life, uh, stopped the, the mental attitude, the boredom as it has been for everyone needs something uh, and I started doing these paintings and thank God people are buying them and they love them and that's another bit of me in their house which I've and it's all memories. Yeah. They're buying them as memories. Most of them are landmarks where it means a lot to the family. Our dogs or cats are no longer there. They have it up on the wall. That's my wee sign yeah. off. Oh, well, brilliant. <laughs> George, thank you so much for coming in. Not and uh, the best of luck with the show. Brilliant. And Merry Christmas to Merry you and Christmas. all the guys here. Thank you. Cheers, Robin. OK, time now for our first piece of a festive music. And this track has been described as a seasonal song with teeth. This is called The Festive Fox from Otter Debauchery. Have a look at this. So we'll have some more festive tracks on the show a little bit later on, but we're going to talk about uh, the stresses involved with uh, this time of year now with uh, Joanna Denton. Of course, she had a book out um, a couple of years back called A Different Truth. We had her on the show earlier this year, and it's great to have her in the studio. Joanna, welcome. Thank you for inviting me on. No problem, but you should be used to all this publicity and stuff now because um, your background, you were doing like the tax consultancy right. thing. You put all that behind you. Absolutely. And now you're a public speaker and you're having fun talking Talking for a living. I know. Well, listen, to be fair, the first time I was on stage, I was four. Right. In a tutu <laughs> uh, at the Riverside Theatre. 
um, telling everyone to come on stage far too early. Right. Um, and then I kind of, I always loved being on stage. And then when I started my tax career, a big part of my job was speaking on stages all around Europe about tax and um, you know technology and things like that. So when I when I decided to leave tax, I, I, basically what I started doing was coaching people on public speaking, and I, you know I did my TEDx speeches and and things like that, podcasting and everything else. So yes, I talk by the kilo, and this is my day job to <laughs> to talk about stuff. Uh, so yes. Oh, we'll talk about the festive time of year in just a second. Yeah. Tell us about uh, the book because that did very well, didn't it? Well, thank you. So the book's called A Different Truth. And it's essentially about the stories that we tell ourselves that become so ingrained that it becomes the truth. One of my truths was, if I'm not working ridiculously long hours, then that means I'm not professional and I'm not dedicated. And of course that led to the burnouts and everything else. So it's, it's a, a little bit of the story of coming back from burnout and, and a story about taking it into the future and, and um, living a different life so that you don't need to wait till your life is falling apart before you do something about it. So you got to that stage of burnout then in your life. How bad was it? If you can imagine going through life, walking through molasses in a world where all the colour and joy has been sucked dry, that was pretty much what my life was like. Um, and yeah, I kind of super glued to the sofa, didn't want to wash, didn't want to eat, didn't want to go outside. And also I didn't want to tell anyone because I thought if I tell people that I'm going through this, they're going to think that I'm weak and they're going to think that I'm broken and, and so on. And I, and I had to kind of get to grips with that and, and kind of reach out for help and, and which I did and you know um, in the book I go into what it took to kind of to change that which was actually the death by suicide of a, of a colleague and, and actually kind of looking at that and, and realizing that um, particularly from what his friend said at the funeral you know he died at the age of 67 and, and he was a gentleman and a gentleman and I needed to be there and when I got there what I realized um, during the ceremony was that he had died by suicide but his friends were there saying, listen, we'd have been there. Mm -hmm. All he had to do was ask. And for me, that was a mirror of what I was living, of kind of thinking I had to be the strong one and I had to put on this facade. And, and um, so, yeah, so that was what it took to kind of reach out for help. And, and that was back in 2014. And I changed my life considerably since and, and everything else. But it, it continues to be an ongoing thing of, of this idea of reaching out and asking for help. And I think particularly now, you know, around Christmas, we have yeah. so many people that... I think Christmas is a stressful time anyway. Christmas starts in October, you know, and, and there's that kind of constant pressure of what presents am I going to get and what are we going to eat and how do I decorate the place? And, and it kind of culminates then in this one day where for there's the kind of anxiety of getting it all right. And then there's the aspect of um, for some people, you know, who are divorced or they're widowed or they're away from their kids, they can't see family at home and it's an incredibly lonely time for others who are suddenly with the family and this kind of enforced extended period of time with them. It's like, Aah! so it stresses as well. And, and all of these things kind of come up around this kind of time of, of year, I think. So any tips you can give us then for helping us through the festive period this year? What kind of things can we do to combat that stress then? Um, I think they're probably different things, but I think one of my favorite, um, a friend of mine told me this the other day, if at first you don't succeed, lower your expectations right yes. and I think that's I think that's a that's a key thing it's about having compassion for yourself you know you've got you've got a lot of stuff going on we can't do everything that's okay doesn't need to be 150 percent perfect and I think also just kind of celebrating the small wins and 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 taking joy again out of the small things in life it doesn't have to be this big kind of mm -hmm. extraordinary extraordinary life 120 percent of the time you know the, the small wins are are just as as precious i think as the as the constant of anything else i want to talk to you about uh, changing a career as well because mm -hmm. you obviously did it you had this big high-powered job and there's probably people out there who are doing similar jobs to you are, maybe CEOs of companies, have been doing it for a long time, they want to give up, but they're afraid of what the future is in store for them. It's, it's never too old to start again, is it? It's never too old to start again. Um, by the time I left tax, I didn't, in, in a lot of ways, I didn't have a choice. I was so, I mean, I, the second burnout, there was part of me that felt if I didn't change my life, I'd be dead by 45. Now that's very dramatic and no doctors ever said that to me, but it was, you know, the panic attacks, the, the evening spent in the ER because you're having heart palpitations, the checklists to go anywhere and all of that sort of thing. And it just, it just became all consuming. But I think it's, 
I, I think it's important for anyone out there to think they don't have to wait until that stage to make changes in life. I think that we get tied up in this story that we don't have a choice um, but to do a job that's sucking our soul dry because we've got to pay for the big house and the big car and the kids and, and all of that sort of thing. And, and I think a big part of the work that I do with my clients and I had to do for myself was, getting, was identifying that mindset aspect, those stories that we were telling ourselves and looking at them and saying, is this helping me or is this hindering me? And what could be a different truth about that? What could be a different perspective on that? Mm -hmm. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, your, your, your kids aren't, yes, you might think that they, they want the big holidays and the tennis lessons and, and whatever else, but often the kids just want you home. Yeah. And I think for families that aren't in that situation of tennis lessons or whatever else, who are working, are working blooming hard just to put, you know, keep food on the table and not be, um, you know, not be suffering like that. It's this, it's the same thing, you know, but I don't think, I think we all as human beings all have the right to have happiness in our lives and, and find a way just to breathe and, and just to spend time with the people that we love. Cause at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that, you know, that the people that we love and, and uh, yeah. Tell me about your podcast as well, because you've had some very interesting guests on, yes. on that, haven't you? So the podcast is Joe and JJ Go Mental. Um, I, co-host that with uh, Dr. JJ Kelly, who is based in Portland in California. So she is a clinical psychologist and basically we bring together cross Atlantic different perspectives on, on mental health, emotional intelligence. I would say that probably a, a, a common theme to everything is about the, the grace and joy of just being yourself mm -hmm. and allowing other people to see you as you are. Because many of us go through life putting on this facade of whatever it is that we believe that we have to have a facade of, you know? Yeah. Um, for me, as a, as a tax consultant, I believed I had to be the perfect tax consultant. I had to be the tax geek that could make it interesting. Um, all of those aspects, but for other people, it's about being maybe the perfect parent or the perfect spouse or, or whatever it is that they do. And so this kind of dichotomy that we find of um, wanting to put up a front and appear as, as some kind of image that we think we have to be mm -hmm. and at the same time craving the human connection where people where others can see who we are and that's difficult you know when you're not showing who you are it's difficult for anyone else to see who yeah. you are and letting that down and and we know the people I think we all know the people that we can really be ourselves with um, and for many of us we just go through life trying to be trying to appear as somebody else for everyone else and it's exhausting yeah yeah. It was exhausting having to be the perfect tax consultant that knew what was going on when, when every part of my being was screaming out with self-doubt and, and fear about, am I doing this right? It was exhausting, you know, having to be, trying to be the perfect girlfriend when, when to give you an example of what I would do, um, if I wanted to know what my opinion was, I'd see what my boyfriend had to say before I gave it. I was so clinging on to this idea of, pleasing other people, negating who I was. Now I'm very much of the view of, this is who I am. Yes, Take yeah. it or leave it. I'm an author, I'm a podcaster, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a businesswoman. If you can't handle it, tatty bye. Well, people can check out your podcast. They're still yes. out there. The book is still available as well. Absolutely. Get that Waterstones in Lisburn, among other places, and online as well. Fabulous. What's Christmas going to store for you? Quiet day on Christmas Day with my parents, and then uh, Boxing Day we ha we generally have a kind of orphans lunch where we invite people around that are on their own at Christmas, uh, you know, on yeah. Boxing Day and, yeah. and so on. And it's you know, my mum's a brilliant cook. Um, I generally show up and do the washing up, um, <laughs> so I, I need to kind of follow my own advice and let her delegate a bit more in that respect. But yeah, it's going to be a nice a nice time uh, with family. Great stuff. Well, Joanna, great to talk to you as and always. You too. Good to see you in person I know. as well. Oh, instead my goodness, of Zoom, we, yes. we actually exist in real life. <laughs> and uh, have a great Christmas. Thank you. The same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, my next guest we'll all remember as uh, one of the biggest soap characters in EastEnders over the past a number of years. She's famous for playing the part of Pat Butcher. And on the show today, she's going to be talking about her work with the animal charity Brooke. Here's what happens when I met Pam St. Clement. So I'm pleased to say that uh, Pam St. Clement joins me now on the line. Pam, how are you today? 
I'm fine, thank you, and I hope you are. Very well, thank you. So, yeah, so we're talking today about um, animals and um, specifically the hard-working donkeys and horses, especially this time of year. And before I came on to talk to you there, I took a look through the internet and found some horrific uh, visuals and things of these animals and the way they're kind of mistreated, aren't they? I'm afraid they are, but that's more through ignorance than direct cruelty, which you might see in a more developed country, because we're talking about animals that are are working uh, uh, across Africa, Asia, the Middle East and Latin America. One can see where that idea comes from, that if if your donkey or horse is your lifeline, it carries your water, your food, your goods, your children to school, whatever it might be. They do all the work. The, The temptation is to think, the more you do, the more benefit you get as a human being, whether it be in money because you're carrying goods, bricks from kilns, whatever it might be. Uh, but it doesn't work like that because you're on a, hiding to nowhere. Your animal is overworked, can get ill, can get damaged in some way, injured. So it, really what, what Brooke does is, is try to bring lasting change to the lives of, of working animals to help those that are sick and overworked and help basically to help the owners understand that if they look after their animal it's the greatest asset they have in their life so look after it don't overwork it and there's supports uh, you know support for communities local health providers and policy makers to, to bring those an end to suffering and, and, and ensure that the animals can live healthy and happy lives albeit working, there is nothing wrong with that. So why did you decide to get involved with Brooke then? I, I, I know as a child you grew up on a working farm, didn't you? I did indeed, but and, and in the days when not everybody had tractors, um, they would, you know, they were for the rich farmers. Um, and we had two lovely working horses, two shah horses called Duchess and Violet. And also, of course, we had collies because we kept sheep and, and cows. Strangely enough, Brooke had a, a, a presence uh, in uh, in Jordan a long time ago, and I was visiting Petra, and I and I saw the work they were doing. They actually had a presence there, a veterinary presence, and I saw the work they were doing. And having seen in various countries in Southeast Asia and in the Middle East how donkeys particularly were were worked and treated, uh, I was. <laughs> I was offered a donkey to take me up in Petra from the base of the of Petra up to the monastery up on the hill. And I thought, I'm sorry, but I've got more respect for the, that animal than putting me on its back. There is no way. But that's the sort of attitude that's that's earning and not kind to the animal. And I thought, no, this must go on a lot. And 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 of course it does. And you see, you see those terrible films of what's happened to those wonderful animals. So biddable, so willing, wonderful companions and workers. So if people want some more information on the work that uh, Brooke do, how, how do they get that? The website, the Brook, and that's with an E, Brook. Org. Brilliant. Well, Pam, since I have you on the show today, I've got to tell you as well, we, we've missed you so much on TV over the past uh, right. 10 years. We really have. And uh, being a massive soap fan, the massive EastEnders fan, I've got to say, one of the most uh, heartbreaking scenes on television that I've ever seen was uh, Pat Butcher's death. Was, was that difficult to do? Well, it was difficult because of the, uh, of the context. In other words, I was leaving. Yeah. And I think that made it doubly, although I was the one who I think kept, kept my head straight most of the time and didn't get involved. I couldn't. I couldn't at any at any time we were filming all that. I couldn't come out of character and be me because then I would have had it. But, yeah. you know, whilst ever I kept my eye on the ball, <laughs> I was fine. <laughs> it, it, yes, it was a very strange thing to have to do. And do you miss Pat? I've put her away now. I've put her in the in, in the in the wardrobe like an old coat, um, and I'm not sure that I can even fit in her anymore. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I haven't sort of got over her now. It took a while. It was quite yeah. a, a a period of mourning. And when I look back at all the great scenes that you had over the years, I mean, it must have been totally amazing to work with people like the late great Barbara Windsor. Yes, indeed, I do miss Babs like mad. 
Yes, I, I miss her. I miss everybody at EastEnders, actually. Uh, yeah. It's obviously, it was a large part of my life. And of course, Mike Reed as well, because uh, Pat and Frank were just the, the ultimate soap couple, weren't they? <laughs> yes. Yes, I can remember our executive producer at the time said, uh, it's the only true love story in EastEnders, Pat and Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so what's life like these days for you? Are you keeping busy? Not really. I'm unfortunately one of the vulnerable ones, so I have to be a little bit careful despite having all the jabs. Um, and none of us know what's happening, basically. I, I mean, you know, we're, we're playing it all by ear. I mean, it's, it's, where do we go from here? We have to be spontaneous. And I think I'm not very good at being spontaneous, uh, you know, changing plans on a, you know, on a, just a moment's whim. But um, anyway, no, life goes on. Indeed. And, and actually, it's, it's, it's quite enjoyable. I'm, I'm quite enjoying not having any stress. Yes, yeah. And what's Christmas got in store for you? Do any of us know? Well, I know exactly, yes, yeah. But um, no, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It will, of course. Well, Pam, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much. And thank you for your kind comments. Oh, thank you. Lovely to meet you. Happy Christmas. Okay, our next guest on The Christmas Show has been an actor, he's been a theatre producer, and now, because of the pandemic, he's turned into a hugely successful candle maker. Joe Ray joins us. Joe, how are you, sir? I'm great, Robin. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for joining us. Now, we had um, Pam on the show a few minutes ago, and as I just discovered, you were a massive fan of the classic days of EastEnders, as I was as well. Absolutely loved it. And still my favourite line is when Roy, after all the portrayal that happened in EastEnders, says to her, I hate your earrings. Still brilliant. <laughs> the best put down line ever, but you can't beat it. Let's not talk about EastEnders anymore, because you've had an interesting time, haven't you? I have, I have, like everybody. Um, I had a career that I'd, I'd worked in all my life doing uh, theatre, uh, first as an actor and then as a producer. And like everybody, March 2020, everything changed. So uh, out of work, out of job, nothing to do, all the theatres closed and didn't know what to do next. And all of a sudden, me and Lynn, my wife, having a, a glass of wine, brainstormed and the idea came up, why don't you make candles? Right. So I started to make a few uh, and they were great. Um, and then I spent the rest of the first lockdown developing this, this range of candles and I've now got 30 of them. But how do you do this? I mean, a complete change of career. Did you have to go to candle school or did you simply go on YouTube and just learn? YouTube and books are a wonderful <laughs> thing. And it's not, it, it, it isn't rocket science uh, in terms of you, you get a jar, you put in wax and fragrance yeah. oil and blah, but there is a knack to it. There is a bit of an art to it and it takes a while to get them burning right, right. and an awful lot of money to invest. And because I had a lot of time, yes, like yeah. everybody, I wasn't going anywhere, I wasn't doing anything. I, I, I literally used every day creating these and I burnt hundreds of and hundreds and hundreds just to get it right. They're all different um, smells, aren't they? So yes, yes, yeah. Tell us what we have then. That one you've got is my recent one, which is Coco Sandalwood, because people kept asking me for a sandalwood, and I'll be honest, I don't particularly like the smell. But so this blend uh, of Coco and sandalwood is absolutely beautiful. It reminds you of your summer holidays, mm, doesn't it? That's lovely. It's, it, it's almost like a bit of sun cream in it. That one's Botanic Gardens. Because I, 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 yes, Buckfast. <laughs> Buckfast and students. No, it's lilies and roses. It's supposed to smell like a botanical garden. Oh, what it do does. You think of that? You really smell the roses in mm -hmm. there. And the thing about it is, some people don't like roses, and yeah. a lot of people don't like lilies. But put them together in that blend. Beautiful. And of course, you have one inspired by a big West End musical as well, don't I you? I do, of course. I have one called Miss Saigon. Yes. You have to have a nod to theatre in there yeah. somewhere. So I, I, the inspiration has been taken by things I love, so Miss Saigon's in there. But then also the places that we know. We have a, a, a candle called Helen's Bay, mm -hmm. which smells of money. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it smells of rock, salt and driftwood. It's supposed to smell like the seaside. Right. Um, we have one called Lady Dixon 
which yeah. was inspired by Rose Week up at Lady Dixon Park. Yeah. And of course, we have Botanic Gardens, which uh, smells of lilies and roses and yes, yeah. not Buckfast. <laughs> there we go. OK, well, if people want to get their hands on these candles, how do they do that? Well, uh, I have them in a few stockists. I have uh, uh, them in Penelope's uh, Flower Shop in East Belfast, Warden's in Newton Arts, which have been fantastic, uh, and the Yarn Patch out in Hollywood. So you can get them there, or else the easiest way to get them is online at yeah. leoandlyncandles.com. And of course, the Lynn comes from your wife and the Leo comes from your son, doesn't uh, yep, it? Yep, yeah. indeed. So uh, the way I see it is sell what you love. Yeah. And we use that for the brand and then so on because we wanted to make it quite classy, but also have that lovely warm feel like a family because you're bringing it and you're burning it in your home. So we yeah. wanted something that looks lovely in your home. Brilliant. What's Christmas got in store for you? Christmas is, we, we've got traditions at Christmas, except for last year. We managed to escape and go to Lanzarote for the week, Lovely. but this year we're back at home. Um, we have guests round on uh, Christmas Eve, and then Sunday's quite traditional, or Christmas on whatever day it is, but it's quite traditional, you know, the turkey opening presents, you know, etc. So it'll just be me, Lynn and Leo, uh, lots of food and the TV. Lovely. Thank you for coming in. Have a great Thank Christmas. You. Thank you, Robin, and Merry Christmas. Right, time for another festive song now, and Lamal has just released a new record called One Wish for Christmas. We're going to meet the man himself after we hear his festive tune. Here it is. Selfridges for shopping and cocktails in Mayfair. And you'll be looking pretty through my camera lens as we hear the chimes of Big Ben from our boat trip on the Thames. There we go, some brand new music, You're loving that. That's called uh, One Wish for Christmas, uh, the new Christmas record from Lamal. And I'm pleased to say he joins us now on the line. How are you, sir? Hi, Robin. Yeah, I'm well, thank you. Under the circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> and you're looking nice and festive. You've got the tree up and everything behind you there. Yeah, well, we need something to lift our spirits, don't we? We, we really do. And uh, your record, I have to say, it does just that because it really captures the feeling of uh, being in London at Christmas, doesn't it? I, I wanted to try and avoid the obvious uh, lyrics for a Christmas song. And, and I always wanted to write a song about London because I've lived there 35 years and I've travelled the world, but I still love London. You know, I love the theatre because I started in theatre. And, you know, they only talk about two places in the world for the best theatre, which is obviously Broadway and West End. I'm going to take you back to the 1980s, because, of course, when you started off, you were part of uh, Kajagoogoo, who were massive in the 1980s. And uh, it must have been great to have so much success at, at such a young age. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, to be 23 years old and have your first single go to not just number one in the UK, but number one around the world. And suddenly you, you're flying to do the equivalent top of the pops in every country uh, and seeing the world. You know, I'm just a kid from Wigan. I was raised on a council estate. 
um, quite a poor family. And I always wanted to work in music. You know, that was my dream, really. To, so to be working in music and then to have that kind of success, just a thrill, an absolute thrill. And it still is, really. It's given me a very interesting journey so far. And of course, we all remember watching you on Top of the Pops and shows like that way back then. You must have been meeting some of your heroes, some of the greatest performers of all time. I have, yeah. The ones that stand out for me were um, EMI Records we were signed to and, uh, and of course, Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran produced our first al album and helped us to get the deal. Princess Diana uh, met in a lineup at a, a charity event. It was brief, but it's there for me as a very important moment because of, you know, her life and her legacy. I was invited to Elton John's 40th birthday party at his manager's house, John Reed. And, um, and everybody was there, it was amazing. And, and then the other one was uh, Freddie Mercury, uh, who was also on EMI. So basically somebody in EMI Records said, you know, do you wanna come, do you wanna come to the, the Queen gig at, at Wembley Stadium? And of course I said, yeah. And then there was a party afterwards and I, I was taken to meet Freddie in the, the VIP area. And um, yeah, it was lovely. Really, uh, we we talked a little. Yeah. He was smoking. I was a bit shocked. He was quite effeminate, really, off stage. You know, on stage he's so kind of macho, and he's doing the punches, and the crowd are so the crowd are kind of macho. And there he was with his legs crossed, holding the cigarette a little bit like that. And he looks up at me and he goes, "Darling," <laughs> 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 it was just it was such a contrast. It was crazy. And again, it's such a lovely memory. You might be the first person I've shared that. Oh, well, brilliant. We got an exclusive. Brilliant. <laughs> so you had the, the big machine working with you back then, but now today you're releasing One Wish for Christmas totally independently, totally different. What's your feelings about that? The social media and the internet and the streaming sites have given uh, artists like myself and new artists a way out there um, to, to the new public or to the, to the old fans. Whereas without that, no record company wants to really sign old artists. You know, it is great if you can have a conglomerate behind you, but they're so hard to, to get into, you know. There's, in my day, there were like 25 record labels that you could go to to try and get a record deal. And now, nowadays, they've all been swallowed up by the, the big boys. And basically, you've got four companies. You've got Sony, Warners, Universal, and one other. And it's just, it's just impossible. So in, thank God for online. Are we going to hear any more new music from you in 2022? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, look, the, the important thing to explain is um, in 2019, two massive American TV shows used my two biggest hits. So Never Ending Story was used in Stranger Things on Netflix. And the, the streams of the song went absolutely crazy. They went up from 300,000 a month to 1.5 million. Oh, wow. And then, and then Too Shy was used in American Horror Story. Now, these are global shows. Yeah. They introduce the songs to new audiences, to new younger audiences. In American Horror Story, not only did they use the song, but they actually had Kajagoogoo in the storyline and an actor playing me. <laughs> so when all this happened, I thought, OK, I wonder if anyone's interested in hearing anything new. So in June 2020, last year, in the pandemic year, when I was sitting around like all musicians, all performances cancelled, twiddling my thumbs. I thought, well, okay, I'll, to keep sanity, you know, I'll, I'll get creative. So I put out my first single in 10 years and the responses were so good. Yeah. That kind of encouraged me to do the Christmas track. So the Christmas track that we started talking about came out last year. I'm re-releasing it this year. I'll re-release it next year. I'm going to work it really hard until I hopefully make that thing popular. Yeah. So from those two tracks and from those from the responses that I've had, um, I've decided to record my first album in 25 years. Wow. So 
That's a threat, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> so what's that Christmas got in store for you then? My lovely 83-year-old mum will come down on the 16th uh, from Wigan. She'll stay with me for a week and hopefully we will go to the theatre. Um, I'm taking her out for a nice uh, uh, lunch, dinner lunch thing on, on New Year's Day with my partner's father, who's 85, wow. so that'll be nice. Then my mum goes to my sister's, who lives about half an hour away, and she, she'll she go over there for a few days. Uh, so, yeah, it's basically a family get-together and have um, a family Christmas. Lamal, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, the best of luck with the Christmas record. We love it. We're going to keep playing it on the radio over here, and uh, have yourself a great Christmas. And same to you, Robin. Thanks very much. Now, it wouldn't be Christmas here on NVTV without my next guest. It is the one and only, the legendary Terry Hooley. How are you, sir? I'm very well, Robin, for a change. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Ah, so well, I'm glad to be here because it wouldn't be Christmas without being on the on the show. Christmas officially starts and you walk yeah, in the that door. That does. I've even got my Christmas hat with me today. Have you? Yes. When, when I've been on the show and then I watch Love Actually on TV, I know it's Christmas. <laughs> That's when I get into the Christmas mood. So is that what you're like really at home? You and Claire sit and watch rom-coms and things together? No, I usually watch them on my own. Really? She doesn't like to see a grown man cry at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, uh... <laughs> so what's Christmas got in store for you this year then? Well, Christmas, uh, oh, actually, I've got a special present this year. Have you? Yes. I'm going to collect it tomorrow. We lost our, our, our little Steffi. Uh, Claire's mad about Steffi's. Ours was a street fighting dog, which was found in Antrim. The owners didn't want it. After a week, we didn't want it, but we persevered. And uh, it didn't do any tricks. I just attacked big dogs. And, <laughs> and uh, you couldn't let it out on its own. And, uh, well, we only had it trained to attack Van Morrison. That was it. <laughs> um, so we had to get the dog put down. We didn't want to be suffering. And then Claire had been talking to people and, and was interested in getting a new staffy. And then the other week, we got a phone call to say that there had been a staffy, had been found, had been in the pound for five days, nobody owned it, and its eye was damaged, and it's lost its eye. Just like you. Just like me. There you I go. Mean, perfect. <laughs> so this is my big Christmas present, that we went down to see the dog, and we took her out, and we're gonna call her Amber. Oh. And, because she's a brown dog and stuff, and we're collecting her tomorrow. Lovely. Terry, I was in your kitchen recently. Really? And uh, yes, I was. You're yes. stealing our silver. <laughs> <laughs> and your kitchen has now become a radio studio. It has indeed. Yes. And I wonder why that is, Robin. Because you're on that fabulous new station, Belfast 24-7. You, <laughs> you asked me, and I, I don't know for why. I can't turn you down. <laughs> and you, but you, yes. you sound like you're enjoying yourself. Uh, yes, it is. And, and Claire does the engineering. And the couple that do the radio show together stays together. There you go, yes. So there'll be three of us at, uh, with a dog, Amber. Yeah. But the radio sh show's been really good for me because it's made my, my brain start to work again. Because I've been staying at home an awful lot through COVID and stuff. And, I, and I'm, I'm actually thinking like writing a book about some of the records that I, I'm playing on the show that uh, I'm going back, I'm not playing modern stuff. I'm going back to stuff that I actually love, no matter how bad the record is. You, you went off on a gospel thing the other night when I tuned Oh, I in. love the gospel. Yeah. I mean, the last rock and roll book that I, I read was Mahalia Jackson's life story. Right. And that was because of my good Methodist upbringing, because I was at church every Sunday morning, church Sunday school. Mother was a Sunday school teacher at church at night. And uh, in my youth, I wanted to be a missionary and go to Red China and save all the heathens. Wow, okay. So, uh, and I used to read books about missionaries. And every Sunday, Saturday night, we were taken to the Grosvenor Hall and we watched religious 
films and stuff like that. So I was brought up in, by my, in my mother's family, very Christian. And uh, when my mother used to go into town to her shop and she used to go to St. Mary's chapels to pray because all the Protestant churches were closed. Of course, yes. And then I had my father, who was a socialist and Labour candidate and used to get beat up, stand for election in East Belfast. And so I had the, the socialist side and, and the Christianity and I like to think somewhere in the middle, I become an anarchist. So when it comes to the radio show, you never know what you're going to get really no, from you your don't. show, do you? you don't. I play French music, I play country music, I play soul music, I play a bit of punk. I mean, I mean, a lot of people expect me to, as the grandfather of punk in Belfast, to be playing a lot of punk, and I, I try not to. Yeah. And I don't play a lot of good vibrations records, but I play ones that I think that are interesting, you know. Uh, Lots of 60s girl groups. Oh, God, I love my 60s yes. girl groups. I mean, if you're in our kitchen, you would have seen that I eventually got my poster uh, autographed by the Shangri-Las. Yes, yes. In fact, Ronnie Spector has been played quite a lot on the show. Yes. But I was the loneliest kid in the bedroom. Uh, <laughs> you know, these are the records that I, I play it. And then I tell stories like, uh, you know, like, that I once kissed Silla Black. <laughs> did you? I was, I was, did you not hear that bit? I've never, did, when did you kiss Silla Black? Because I was I, always <laughs> very jealous of people who got to know Silla and got to meet her, because I always wanted to meet her, never well, did. Well, I, I met her in Belfast when she was playing the Whitler Hall. Right. And I had been a big Silla Black fan from her first record, not, not anyone who had a heart, but The Love of the, the Loved. Loved. Which I thought was the first punk record I'd ever heard, and then I heard it recently, and it was like, so tame, it was on. But I thought I just spat out the words. And uh, I, I, I love Scylla, although I do prefer Dion Warwick's Anyone Who Had a Heart. <gasps> so I did. And uh, I, I got a chance to meet Scylla and be kissed. And she said, isn't he tall? Because I was tall for me age then. And <laughs> <laughs> but that isn't the story. The story is I was in the BBC one day and I was doing an interview. Yeah. And I was talking about punk records and stuff. And and then the interviewer said, is it true you once Scylla Black? And I went, yes, I did. And, uh, and, and I'm not ashamed of it. And I said, at that time, I, I was a big Scylla Black fan. And Elvis Presley had Scylla on his jukebox. So there yes, she was number 15 with You're My World. <laughs> but people like the wee stories that I tell, like I, I, I was, when I was 15, I was going out with this girl who lived in a big house of the Belmont Road and they were very rich and we were not so rich. I mean, we had a party the day that we could afford Lino for our, our bathroom, you know, it was a big, big deal in our house. We had tea and buns, you know. And she said to me, uh, well, they, that, uh, they've got an auto man. And I was thinking, they've got a robot. And I said, does it do dishes? And does it do a vacuum cleaning? He says, no, you keep linen, linen it. I had never heard what, what a, a nano man was. <laughs> you can see that that relationship didn't oh, go any further than that. <laughs> brilliant. So, but people like me telling the wee stories. I love the stories as well. And um, we mentioned uh, the late, great Nancy Griffith recently. You yes, knew Nancy. And of I course, knew Nancy well. We sadly lost her earlier this year, didn't we? Hi. Nancy was lovely, so she was. And <laughs> but I'd not be playing her at... The Good Vibrations come by night. Hoolies Hooli. When's Hoolies Hooli then? New, New Year's, Year's Eve. Eve, yes. Okay, we got it back again. So for those three people that wanted it, we're back by public demand. <laughs> and we've got Charlotte Dryden, who runs the OES Centre. Stuart Bailey, who we have, we have toured all over the world doing DJ together. And we've got Stevie Boy Nickel, who I've done a lot of DJing with down in Bangor. This is where I started doing DJ when I was 16, because I couldn't get a gig in Belfast. And what was the venue? Where did you start off? I started off in the Duck Pond <laughs> in Bangor, which was the Scout Hall in Ward Park. Right. It was these girls that uh, were very fond of me, who were a bit older than me and led me astray, got me all these gigs. And uh, where we were living, I know there's a church hall there where I did DJ, but I think they must have knocked it down. I haven't been able to find it. <laughs> OK. So there you go. So all these years later, still going strong and back on New Year's Eve. Not as mad and as crazy as ever. Exactly. New Year's Eve in the OES Centre. 
Yeah. Right. Christmas is here. You can put your Christmas hat on now. You have that down there somewhere. Have I? Or Claire has it standing by. Here she comes. Bring it into yeah. the shot here. Yeah. Why not? Because <laughs> I know you brought it especially for the show. So there we go. A festive. Oh, dear, dear, dear. A festive Terry well, my, mate, my mate Kenny gave me this when I was in <laughs> hospital one Christmas. He wrapped up a bottle of brandy. <laughs> right, I'm going to let you introduce the minnows, OK? Look into that camera over there and say, here's the minnows with Cheer Up Christmas. Greetings. Now we're going to have something special on the show. We are going to have the minnows with their fabulous new track, Cheer Up Christmas. Now let's play another Christmas song, this time something new from singer-songwriter Brendan Quinn. He's got a new song out to raise money for the Welcome organisation and it's called Homeless. Here it is. Out on these streets, nowhere to go, the old man sits. No place called home His old face hurts The breeze and the cold It's on the streets He calls his home His battered bones His face all aglow Those tattered clothes are the only friends he knows This life it passes No one even knows This life it goes As he sits all alone And the people passing by On the streets every night And no one stops To hear his cry It's on the streets He makes a song tonight So that's a track called Homeless, raising money for the Welcome organisation. The man behind it is Brendan Quinn, who joins us now in the studio. How are you, sir? Good, Robin. You're, yourself? Very well, thank you. So congratulations on uh, the new record. Tell us the story behind that, then. Yeah, so it's funny how this one came about, you know, um, just through all my years of gigging and playing and playing at different venues and stuff, you know, from Dublin to Belfast to America, across Europe, you know, 
constantly bumping into people on the streets, you know. Um, I suppose the song just started to turn in my head. Um, and eventually, you know, one morning at about five in the morning, you know, I woke up, the, the, the lyrics from my head, um, you know, started writing them down, putting chords to it. And within about seven hours, you know, the song sort of came together. Um, then after that, you know, I just, you know, sent it off to a friend of mine, uh, Johnny McCulloch, he put some keys down on it, you know, and then I sent it to my brother in Baltimore. He put a few pieces down on it, and then I sent a few, a few other friends over in Florida, and they're actually two brothers as well, you know, and it sort of all just came together, sent it back to Belfast, sent it off to Sean O'Graham, and, you know, we got it mixed in the studio, and it sounded great. So it started to grow legs, you know, and um, we decided to use it for, you know, um, a good cause, yeah. you know. Okay, so let's bring in Kieran from the Welcome Organisation. Obviously, helping to raise awareness and much needed funds for your charity then. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Um, and we have to thank Brendan for thinking of the Welcome Organisation. You're right, Robin, when you say it's just as important to raise awareness about homelessness as it is to, to raise money. Um, homelessness is a, is a big problem um, here in Belfast and across Northern Ireland. Um, every year, over 18,000 people present to the Housing Executive as homeless in Northern Ireland, and around 11,000 of those are accepted as, as full duty applicants. Uh, but that's not just people who are sleeping rough on the streets, that's people who are sleeping in hostels or temporary accommodation or sofa surfing or living at risk of violence in the home. So it's all that hidden homelessness mm -hmm. um, that doesn't get talked about as much that's just as important and all the money raised from this single will go towards our work in helping those people. Well tell us about some of the work you've been doing this year because you've got this new big uh, health kind of truck thing haven't you that's out there? Yes, it's our mobile health unit, um, which is a new service for us. Um, uh, it came about through our contact with um, Belfast Live uh, and the Welcome Organisation working together. We wanted to bring a new service uh, to help people who are homeless. So the mobile health unit is a van. It's been converted to have a, a waiting room, a consultation room. There's hot and cold water in it. There's a fridge for vaccines. And what we're doing is we're working with uh, nursing teams across Northern Ireland to bring homeless health care out to people where they are at. Um, there are barriers for people who are homeless to access in health care. They don't maybe access primary health care as easily as you, you and I might. So we want to bring ho homeless health care out to people, whether it's on the streets or whether it's going to hostels and having a drop-in clinic. Um, so in the last week alone, we've been at hostels providing flu vaccines, providing COVID boosters, um, doing bloodborne virus tests, referring people to other services. Um, so it's, it's an amazing service, something that we're really excited about and that's something that's potentially life-saving. And of course, at this time of year, it must be a particularly challenging and difficult time for yourselves out there. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it can be difficult. Um, homelessness is year round, um, but as you, you know yourself, we've been through some very rough weather recently, um, a few very bad storms, and you can imagine spending the whole night on the streets, how difficult uh, that can be. Um, we have a street outreach team that are on the streets of Belfast up until two o'clock every morning, every night of the year, um, including Christmas Day. All our services will be running as normal throughout the Christmas period. Period. Um, but it's also an important time for people getting involved and wanting to help us um, and, and we do encourage that and that support is gratefully received because we are a charity and, and we rely on the support of the public and people like Brendan thinking of us. You mentioned earlier the hidden homeless side of things as well that people don't really know about and things like sofa surfing for people who don't know what exactly is that? Yeah exactly the, the most obvious and visual sign of, of homelessness is people who are sleeping on the streets fully bedded down for the night but there is, a, as you say, a lot more to homelessness than that. So sofa surfing is, is just basically getting a, a, a friend's sofa or sleeping on their couch or sleeping on their floor, just wherever you can get a bed for the night. Uh, you might be out in the street the next night or you might be trying to get a hostel the following night. It's very insecure, very unstable and just not uh, a normal home environment that, that you and I might be familiar with. Um, so that's hidden homelessness and it's a, it's a big problem um, here in Northern Ireland as well as people who are sleeping rough on the streets. So Brendan, if people want to get their hands on the new single and help support the charity, how do they do that? So they can go through uh, homelessbelfast 
www.ghostbusters.org and um, they can all the information will be coming up on the screen below. Yep, it's all coming up on the screen right now, guys. Thank you so much for coming in. The very best of luck with the new yep. single. Well, that's all we have time for on the Big Show Christmas special of this year. Thank you to all of my guests. Thank you for watching. Have yourselves a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. See you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah.